All right, and welcome to the monthly OCD Rhode Island lecture series. I'm Jamie Valdez. I'm a licensed mental health counselor. Um, and this is my friend and employee, Mary Walters. We'll be introducing ourselves a little bit more in just a minute. Tonight, we're gonna be discussing how to incorporate ACT, um, which is acceptance and commitment therapy into ERP, which is exposure and response prevention. It is a question and answer session, so please feel free to type something in the chat or to unmute yourself and ask a question or provide any thoughts or feedback as we go through um, the presentation. You'll also have time at the end um, to ask questions. All right, so we're just gonna go over some quick introductions of ourselves. Um, the objectives of how to incorporate ACT into ERP. We'll go over the definition and applications of ERP as well as the same thing for ACT so that you can understand how they're similar and um, can be used in complementary ways. So then we'll talk about how to, how to utilize ACT as a support or an adjunct to traditional ERP therapy for OCD. Uh, Mary and I will talk a little bit about how we use ACT and ERP together in treatment for our clients, and we'll be taking questions. Anything you want to add, Mary? Uh, no, I think that that's a, a great way to go through our presentation. Okay. I'm excited. <laughs> um, so Mary and I work at Clearview OCD Counseling, um, which is based in Worcester, but we provide um, therapy throughout Massachusetts by video. And um, we also provide training to other clinicians um, or anybody who's interested in that um, in, in lots of different settings. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry. All right, so I'm um, the director and founder of Clearview, and I'm also on the board of directors for OCD Rhode Island, as well as OCD Massachusetts, um, two nonprofit official affiliates of the International OCD Foundation. And we basically do volunteer outreach and awareness work around OCD and related disorders. Mary, you wanna give a little intro about who you are? Yeah, so I am a full-time OCD specialist at Clearview. Uh, the majority of my caseload is OCD and related disorders, but I do a fun mix of other things as well. Um, and I'm currently pre-licensure, working my way towards getting fully licensed. All right, we're looking forward to when that day comes for sure. Okay. Um, yep. So we have uh, three presentation objectives for you guys today. The first one is that we're hoping to learn about the six core principles of acceptance and commitment therapy and how to apply them. So your first takeaway from this presentation is going to be that you're going to know how to define acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT. The second presentation objective is we're going to learn more about ERP, how we use it to treat OCD and other disorders, and you're going to walk away with a deeper understanding of what ERP is and how to apply it. And our final presentation objective for today is we're going to learn how to bridge ACT and ERP together. And we're going to learn how that specifically improves treatment outcomes for our clients. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that we like to start with when we're working with our own clients is, is how, how we define OCD. I think pretty much everyone is familiar with it standing for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, we've put a little twist on it at Clearview, which I think is going to help everybody understand how to utilize ACT and ERP in a very fluid manner. Um, so our definition is um, that the O, instead of standing for obsessive, it's going to stand for the original intrusion. So this is the first thing that shows up in your internal experience. Um, and this could include a thought, a body sensation, an emotion or an urge. Those things make up our internal experience. And so when we think of intrusions at Clearview, we think of that original thing that pops onto the map. It may not be a thought, it may be a just not right feeling. And we'll, we'll get into more of that later. Um, we also teach clients what a compulsion is. And this helps separate the, the part that is spontaneous and difficult to control the original intrusion from the behavior, 
which we do have a lot of control over. A compulsion is a behavior that serves one or two purposes. The first is to reduce or eliminate the amount of discomfort that the original intrusion caused. Um, the second purpose or function behind a compulsion would be to prevent a situation from happening in which somebody would have to experience discomfort. Um, so again, at Clearview, we, we start with this to help separate the O, you're gonna have a very difficult time trying to control that, um, but the C, the compulsion, you will be able to have a lot of control over once you start learning ACT and ERP skills. Um, and then the D for disordered just means that your symptoms are so pervasive that they're disrupting multiple areas of your life. Um, so thoughts aren't um, anything unusual. E every person has thoughts or body sensations. It's that the compulsive or avoidant response to them has become so problematic that it fits certain criteria to be called a disorder. Sorry, just one second here. Okay, there we go. There we go. So what's exposure and response prevention, right? So the exposure in ERP or the E is allowing yourself to experience the thoughts, the images, the body sensations that Jamie was describing in the previous slide that make you feel uncomfortable, right? We need to learn to have a willingness to sit with this discomfort and to experience it. The RP for exposure and response prevention is really where the magic happens. That's the response prevention. So instead of compulsing, right, instead of going with the learned behavior that we usually use, we're going to replace it with something of value. We're going to change how we react to it. When we sit with discomfort over time, we're no longer as uncomfortable. So a lot of listeners probably already know this, but we did want to go over it in case there's some people new to OCD treatment. There are different ways to do exposure therapy or what we call ERP. Um, one is called in vivo, which in Latin means in real life. And so that would be an example of an in vivo exposure would be if somebody was afraid of um, getting their hands dirty, we might have them in real life get their hands dirty by playing with mud or scooping up dust from a corner or something like that. And then we would have them do, as Mary said, where the magic happens, the response prevention. So if if their typical compulsive or avoidant response is, um, is to wash their hands, then we would ask that person to not wash their hands in real life and to find a willingness to sit with that discomfort. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Another type of ERP is called imaginal um, and that can include writing scripts or visualizing an experience this is particularly useful for exposures where um, you, you can't do an in real life thing because it would be dangerous or unhealthy. Uh, the other type of exposure is called interoceptive and that's exposing someone to the body sensations like a rush of adrenaline or feeling dizzy if they have panic symptoms. And then, um, and then, one thing that, that we work on once somebody's farther into treatment is layering or what's called deepened extinction. And that's where you don't just get good at getting your hands dirty with mud in your own backyard. You start generalizing these concepts to all different kinds of environments and situations. So we might have somebody get their hands dirty in lots of different places, but also maybe with some other triggers, like we might have them get some body sensations going so that they're having multiple um, triggers on top of one another. And what we're gonna show you is how with ACT, there's almost an invitation to do that. So exposure therapy can sound really scary, but it's not as scary when we, we think at least in our clients report, it's, it's not as difficult or scary once they have a formulation for acceptance and commitment therapy in their head. Um, so instead of fighting against a fear, as Mary mentioned a few minutes ago, we're gonna be working on walking toward a valued, a, a valued behavior. Mm -hmm. We did get a question in the chat box. Do you wanna okay. pause and read the yeah. question now? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. 
So this question is from Spencer and it says, how would you deal with a client who continues to resist exposure, such as if they haven't grown more comfortable after multiple exposure sessions? Oh, that's a good one. That is a good one. Do you want to start or do you want me to start? Um, I'll start. So we take it step by step. So we're, we'll get into this more in the slide, but really with the word acceptance and acceptance commitment therapy um, is the word willingness, right? So we start with that willingness of where are you willing to start, right? Maybe you're not willing to stop washing your hands completely, but maybe you are willing to use one less pump of soap, or maybe you are willing to wash your hands for five seconds less, right? So we build on that willingness. It's never like a zero to 60, um, you know, it's never like, oh, you're afraid of spiders. All right, here's a spider, hold the spider, right? We start talking about the most minimal basic parts first, and then we build that confidence as we go. And as we build skills, right, um, which we will explain in a moment when we go through the six core principles of ACT, they have these skills to rely on as well as their values. And that helps them to build that confidence to take those steps. Um, Jamie, do you want to add and build off of that? Yeah, I would just add, and I think we're going to get into this in a later slide as well, but um, we're very big on education and on teaching clients what's happening with their body sensations, their thought patterns, their behavior patterns. Um, because we believe that when people know and understand what's going on, the, the willingness is much higher. They're, they're, they're not doing it just because, or just because somebody said this is the gold standard treatment. They're doing it because it makes a lot of sense to them. And everybody has a point at which they're able to go from unwilling to experience something to willing to experience it. And I think we just work with clients to find where that willingness is and how we can make it greater. Um, so I hope that answered your question. If it didn't, please write more in the chat box. Um, so going over the concept of internal experience is critical to understanding acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, hang on one second, guys. Oh, okay, I see. Um, so your internal experience is basically your own private world. No one else has access to it. No one can read your mind or know what you're feeling in any given moment unless you use a behavior and tell them or draw it or in some other way communicate through a behavior what's going on with your private world. So your internal experience is made up of these things, um, thoughts, which can include memories, images, command thoughts, um, and I apologize, but I can't see my entire screen here because of the way that this chat is set up, but, um, but I think you get the idea of what thoughts um, can look like. Your internal experience is also composed of your emotions, um, and this is all of them. So happiness, boredom, anxiety, grief, um, a feeling of contentment, fear, um, all the emotions, urges, um, which is just a strong oomph, like a strong desire to engage in a behavior. Um, so like, I just wanna eat a bag of Cheetos right now, or I just wanna leave work and go take a nap. I have an urge to engage in this behavior. Um, I just cooked dinner and I think there's probably something spoiled in it. And so I just have a strong urge to throw it in the trash. And I'm also having thoughts about that as well as some body sensations, um, which again, include all the body sensations. So hunger, itch, pleasure, a rush of adrenaline. Um, often we hear from people who experience just not right or just right, however you wanna um, frame it. Um, OCD, that they experience a lot of physical tension in their bodies. It's just, an, it's an uncomfortable feeling that they can't really put into words, but it feels very bodily to a lot of people with this subtype of OCD. Anything you want to add, Mary? No, I think that was, that was great. So moving on to what ACT is, right? So we, we use the acronym 
Um, and we say it as if it is a word because there is a huge proponent on action here, right? So it's not ACT, it's ACT. Um, and what ACT is, is it's a more of a third wave component of CBT that focuses on psychological flexibility and values. And ACT can be defined by six core components. So if we wanna move on to that slide, right? So our core principles of ACT are diffusion, expansion, connection, the observing self, values, and committed action. So if we go through each of these one by one, right? The first one is diffusion. When we diffuse our thoughts, we relate to them in a new way. Oftentimes in OCD, there is a propensity, there's a propensity of thought action fusion. And the way that I like to think about thought action fusion is by using my hands and doing this. There we go, there's my camera, right? We're fused, we're stuck in it, we're bound, we're bound to it, right? So if we get a thought that is a command thought that says, it's your head or something bad will happen, or it says, if you think this hard enough, it'll come true. We've fused with that thought. Right. So when we use diffusion, we allow ourselves to observe and to notice our thoughts in a new way. Right. We're still engaging with the thought, but we're no longer engaging with it in the exact same way. Likewise, there's the concept of expansion. Expansion makes room for our feelings, our thoughts and our sensations. This is really where we get the acceptance that comes in here. So expansion says no matter how much of an emotion that I feel, I have room for it. I can sit with it. No one emotion can overtake me. This emotion can be a 10 out of 10. It could be the worst cry in my life. It could be the worst panic in my life. I can still survive it. I can still handle it. And I can relate to it in a new way. Three is connection. That's focusing on and engaging in the present moment. And we can connect with everything. We can connect with things that we love. We can connect with things that we really don't like, you know? Um, I'm not a huge fan of washing my dog, but I connect with that moment and the smells and the sensations of it, even though it's not my favorite thing in the world, because that's a moment that I'm present for. Four is one of my favorite concepts. That's the observing self. The observing self notices things as they are. So instead of ascribing a judgment or ascribing an opinion on something, the observing self just states the facts. Right. Um, five is values. This is a huge part of our work with our clients. We have them define what's most important to them. Values are things that we want to strive towards. So a value is not an end goal um, and it is not a goal. Right. A value is not stagnant. A value is a state of being. Right. So an example that I often use is the value of learning. So some people will say, well, school is my value, right? Well, when we break that down, the love of learning is the value. The goal is to get the straight A's. The goal is to do well on the test, right? But when we lean into the value, it says, all right, no, well, no matter what grade I get or how well I do, I'm doing this because I love learning, because it brings me fulfillment. So we ask our clients, what brings you fulfillment? How can you lean into this fulfillment in your life? And finally, the last act, the last uh, core principle is committed action. So once we have those values, we decide, all right, what do I want to do with my time? And this is how it bridges into the ERP where we get the RP. And thank, thank you. That, that was very well said, Mary. One thing I want to note about ACT is that um, some of the early developers of it have said that if they could go back in time and change the name, they, they, they may not have used the word acceptance because it's kind of a loaded word and it makes people think they have to accept, you know, the injustices in the world or they have to accept their condition or their disorder, which feels unfair. Um, what, what the founders of ACT have said is that they would have replaced the word acceptance with willingness. So a willingness to allow um, your internal experience to happen using some of these strategies like diffusion. And I like the way you described it, Mary. I picture it as two pieces of metal fused together. You can't break them apart. When we defuse from a thought or a body sensation or an urge, we're just taking a little step outside of it so that we can go to that number four principle of the observing self and kind of watch that experience take place and have willingness to let it be there rather than struggle back and forth with it. Mm -hmm. We also got another uh, question in the chat box, Jamie, about what's a type of diffusion technique that we use that we see with clients. 
Um, do you want to give an example or do you want me to give an example? I think we both can. I know which one I'm going to do because it always like, I mean, there, there's so many examples, but um, one that's very simple is to turn a thought into a what if statement. Um, so what if I don't love my partner enough? And then you just sing it to the tune of happy birthday. You stole what mine. I love my partner enough. Oh, did I? Yeah, it's okay. I got another one. <laughs> What, what if I'm gonna fail at relationships? What if I suck at everything I do? What if I don't love my partner enough? Um, but there's plenty more, like you can wrap your thoughts. I picture Eminem in like a cornfield with a burning barn behind him. And then I actually bust out some raps with my clients and it's not to make fun of the thoughts, it's to give you a little space from it. Um, Another, another strategy is to write, um, write your thought as if it was a newspaper headline. Um, so what if I lose control, or no, so, um, you know, OCD therapist loses control and murders 20 people with her car. Um, so that, that might be an example of a harm OCD thought, um, you know, 22 year old woman, um, wonders if she pushed someone in front of a train. Turns out she did, um, you know, mm -hmm. so, so trying, trying to turn it into a newspaper headline again, so that you can have a little distance from the content. This is just language in your head that ju just because it showed up doesn't mean that it's automatically true or mm -hmm. even all that important. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't know One if of there's others you wanna throw Oh out. yeah. One of my favorites is to break apart the statement, right now I notice I'm having the thought that, and we say the thought with each one as we come across it. And this one both br bridges diffusion and expansion because we're also noticing how we feel as we say the statement multiple times, right? So maybe my intrusive thought is like, what if I kill my cat, right? I notice, I'm having the thought that I'm going to kill my cat. Right now, I notice I'm having the thought that I'm going to kill my cat. And I sit in my body and I observe where it's happening in my body. In this moment, right now, I am noticing that I'm having the thought that I'm going to kill my cat. And we just take that step back. Ooh, there we go, back. As my hand fades into the ocean is so I think we focused a lot on the acceptance or the willingness to experience peace, but I, I don't want to shortchange the CT and act the commitment therapy, um, doing a committed action based on your value system. So the only reason that you're worrying that you might kill your cat is because your cat is of value to you. We don't worry about things that aren't important to us. Um, so a committed action there would be to go and pet your cat. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what happens with a lot of people who experience OCD is they start avoiding and they worry if they go near the cat, they'll lose control, then they'll hurt the cat unintentionally. So that's where we start linking the exposure because, because a committed action is exposure, mm -hmm. um, but we're linking it to your value system, which is individual for each person. And that's part of the work we do is help clients come to an understanding of what their values are um, and then how to make their behavior be parallel to their values, not parallel to their fears, anxieties, intrusions, things like that. Mm -hmm. This is a great segue into our next slide, which actually gives examples of values. One second, there we go. So we have put up you know, four examples of values here on our screen, right? Community, willingness, learning, and authenticity. Um, as we've already stated, values are not activities or goals. We can do activities or goals within our values. We can use activities and goals as the committed action to lean into our values, but the value is the thing that we are always striving towards. Um, you know, and the easiest way to identify values here is to work backwards. So Jamie, do you want to give an example of that? Because you're the one who came up with that on our, our yeah, our PowerPoint. Um, so, so one way that I help clients identify their values, I mean, of course you can go and Google, you know, lists of values online and look at those. You want to be careful to not 
um, like a lot of times these lists have activities or goals, um, you know, like mm -hmm. um, baking a pie when really the, the value there is around creativity or, or community sharing with others. Um, so you can have three people all bake a pie and they might be doing it based on a different motivating value. Um, so one might be wanting to bake a pie to bring to a community fundraiser. Um, one might be wanting to bake a pie because they enjoy the creativity and the learning involved, the experimentation. And another might be doing it to um, bring to her nephew's birthday party because she places a very high, high value on family. So we want to look for what really is the value here. And one, one way to do it is to work backwards. So you say, what makes me feel terrified? What, what makes me feel really enraged, really angry? Um, so I know like for, for me, when I read um, a newspaper article about any kind of abuse, um, you know, animals, children, uh, vulnerable people, that I, I get like a really strong reaction when I read that kind of newspaper article which indicates to me that on the flip side of that coin of feeling kind of awful when I read those articles on the flip side is it's because it's touching on a value for me. Like if I read a newspaper article about cabbage, I don't super care a lot because I don't place like a really high value on cabbage or lettuces or anything like that. But I do as a therapist place a high value on people's wellness and safety. So that's a good way to identify what your values are start by asking what makes me feel upset. And that, that could mean anxious, uncomfortable, angry, but it's touching on something important to you there. So when we're applying ACT, right, you can see through this diagram, we start with psychological and behavioral flexibility, right? So when we break that down, psychological and behavioral flexibility split off into two parts. They split off into mindfulness and willingness right? So mindfulness is being right here, right now. So in this moment, how can I connect with all five of my senses? What am I feeling in my body? What are my emotions? Can I do that without judgment? The answer is yes, you can, but it's learning how to sit. If, so, if an intrusion pops into your head or your body, mm -hmm. um, when we say without judgment, what we mean by that is that if you do get an intrusion, you just notice it. You go to that observer self rather than say, you know, dang it, why can't I stay in the here and now? I keep thinking about what happened yesterday. Um, just note that it happened and bring yourself back to the present moment. Mm -hmm. And when we do that and we do it often enough, we see decreased discomfort over time. There's no longer that type of emotional reactivity. The second part is willingness. Willingness is that, that secret W that is an act, <laughs> um, that is an openness to our internal experiences. Right, and we've, we've touched on that, but when we're willing, when we let ourselves do the things that scare us, we get that sense of accomplishment, pride, and confidence. So back to the, the cat example, right? When I become finally willing to pet my cat, I feel accomplished. I'm able to bond with my cat. I'm able to have a moment and be mindful. And just to be clear, what we're also talking about, if you haven't noticed, this is ERP. And one thing that, that we do know about ERP is that you don't need to have your discomfort immediately decreased in order for the exposure to be successful. Sometimes what you get out of that experience is that you learn something new, you feel proud of yourself, you gain some confidence that you can handle tough situations or tough experiences. Um, and then usually that, that discomfort comes down over time, but it may not happen the first time you pet the cat. What we want to know is, can you pet the cat because you love the cat and you value your relationship with the cat? And then how do you feel about having been able to do that? And what did your brain learn? Because what, what probably happens there is that all that happens is you pet the cat and maybe you felt uncomfortable, but nothing happened to the cat. And the only way you're going to find that out is by testing it out. Um, so we like to think of um, ACT and ERP as they're, they're the same coin. It's just two different sides of it. Another way that I like to describe it is that 
they're, they're just two different languages. You know, one's French and one is Spanish, but they're saying the exact same sentence. ACT and ERP are saying the same things. Um, ACT is used um, for many other difficulties or disorders. Um, it's called transdiagnostic because it can be applied to all kinds of things like depression um, or, you know, a tough day at the office. But um, ACT is exposure. Uh, it's not like a separate, it, it does have a separate way of talking about exposure and of talking about response prevention, but it's just different words for a very similar concept. Um, it has been shown in the study so far to be equally effective um, as ERP in treating OCD and related disorders. The only caveat is that we suggest that somebody struggling with OCD or a related disorder doesn't just see an ACT specialist um, because they may not have a foundational understanding of what ERP is. We do want that therapist to be able to do ERP, talk about it, explain what it is, assign homework, things like that, but then have this complementary treatment modality of ACT on top of that. Um, and, and we've seen that that can work very well for clients. Sorry, there's just a little delay here with the slides. There we go. Okay, so we've kind of gone over a lot of this. Um, Mary, I don't know if you wanna add anything here or summarize the slide. Yeah, so when we look at you know, the acceptance, right? We've already defined that really as willingness to experience our internal world, right? So as Jamie mentioned in the previous slide, that willingness is that exposure, right? Because ERP is just the activity for us to be able to lean into that value and break that habit of avoidance. Um, let's see. Um, at Clearview especially, I think that this is the bullet point we can focus on the most, um, is how we combine it to teach these concepts. So as Jamie mentioned at the very beginning, we're huge on education. We're huge on teaching about the disorder, teaching about the techniques, and then for you to be able to apply it yourself, right? So when we use the act, right, we have that willingness, we have that committed action, we bridge them together, combine it with the ERP, and it creates this lovely combination that fuels you with the confidence and the ability to be able to be like, oh, actually, I can. And even if the worst case scenario happens, I can handle it. I don't have to have a calm sensation in my internal experience in order to be able to handle something. I could be panicking. I could be shaking on the inside, right? Um, but my committed action is going to lean into that value. My committed action is going to say, all right, instead of avoiding, instead of you know, overcompensating by compulsing in another way, I'm doing this instead. And I think what's been so nice to see is that sometimes or very often we've we've had clients that we've worked with who've gotten really stuck with ERP and ACT gives us just a different language for how to talk about it and some different skills um, for how to address urges to compulse or how to address um, intrusions that somebody may be experiencing. Um, so I think it's nice to kind of have this, this complement to ERP that is still ERP, it's just it's just its own um, way of speaking to how to do exposure and response prevention. Okay, so we, we can really only talk about our treatment model because that's where we work. Um, I, I'm not sure how other clinicians or hospitals or programs are incorporating um, act and ERP together, but our treatment model is basically that, that, that we do a very thorough intake, which is the first one to four sessions, and we're really getting a good idea of what the client's compulsions are. Um, some of you might be familiar with an ERP hierarchy or an ERP menu. This is essentially what we're getting information on in those first sessions, but um, and and we don't focus too much on what the intrusions are. We, we, we do hear from the clients what their intrusions are, 
But what we really focus on is what we can change, which is the behaviors, the compulsions. Um, as we've been driving home, we think that knowledge is power. So our early sessions are spent providing a lot of psychoeducation on the disorder and teaching what ACT and ERP are. Um, then we move into practice and confidence building. Clients go out and try the skills, report back what worked, what didn't. We work on tweaking it and, um, and we go from there. Because, because OCD can leapfrog, it can change topics so frequently. Um, and it's like, you know, it's that game of whack-a-mole. As soon as you get one compulsion down, then something else pops up or OCD finds another sneaky way in. So what we focus on is, um, is trying to build these very generalized skills that people can apply no matter what the intrusion is, no matter if the intrusion's a thought, an urge, an emotion, or a body sensation, or all of them together, um, that clients have strategies that work for them that are very clear and they understand how to use, and that they have a game plan for how to move toward valued behavior instead of avoidant compulsive behavior. Once clients are feeling better, we move into maintenance treatment, sessions start getting scaled back, and then we offer booster sessions. So um, if somebody is out of treatment for a few years and is doing really well, but then something comes up and they, they wanna pop back in for a few sessions and brush up on their skills, then we have a revolving door approach here. Mm -hmm. Anything you wanna add to that, Mary? Um. Uh... The one thing that I want to drive home is that the skills and the psychoeducation that we give, we spend so much time on that because they're so applicable across OCD themes. So let's say right now you're struggling with contamination, right? You, we really get the contamination under wraps. You're feeling good about it. And then in a year or two, maybe it's harm. You can use the same diffusion techniques. You have the foundational skills to be able to continue to lean into those values. So that's why at the beginning, it's so focused on that educational knowledge is power piece. That's just the one thing I want to add. We've gotten a couple of questions um, during the session, but you're welcome to type something into the chat box if you have more specific questions about the information we've gone over or you had another question about OCD. Um, and we'll see if we can answer them for you. I guess we answered everything, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I'm too mad about that. <laughs> um, well, feel, feel free to type in a question if you have one. I'm just gonna go to the contact information slide. Um, so the first is a link to our website, which has a lot of free reading material up on it about ACT, ERP, and OCD. Also um, a blog and, um, and it has links um, on our website to lots of organizations that, that can be helpful. Um, the second website is the International OCD Foundation. If you go to that Find Help tab, um, then you can search for a therapist in your area. Again, we would recommend somebody who is well-trained in ERP. And if you're interested in learning more about ACT, then they have ACT as um, a supplementary thing that they offer. Um, on the International OCD Foundation's website, there's also an article on how to find a therapist who's skilled in treating OCD. And then below that, we have OCD Massachusetts, um, which is the sister affiliate of OCD Rhode Island. And then we have a link to OCD Rhode Island's page at the International OCD Foundation website. And... Was that a question coming in, Mary? I saw something pop up. No, just some okay. lovely words of encouragement. No, oh, <laughs> that's sweet. <laughs> um, okay, well, if nobody has any questions, then, um, then we hope that you learned something new in today's lecture and we hope it helps you or someone that, that you love and care about. All right, thanks.
Thank you guys.